Say hello to Samsung's Galaxy S20 FE, where the FE stands for Fully Engorged. Nah, no, it doesn't. That's a complete lie. It stands for Fan Edition, but my version's possibly slightly less boring. But anyway, Samsung's flagship smartphones aren't exactly typically super affordable, and that's where the Fan Edition steps in, offering a taste of that super premium tech, but at a price that isn't too bowel loosenly horrific. It's basically designed to compete with the likes of the OnePlus 8Ts and the Xiaomi Mi 10T Pros of the world. Now you can grab the Galaxy S20 FE in two different flavours. You've got the LTE version for 599 bob, otherwise this 5G version for 699 quid. And while 5G connectivity isn't particularly trouser rousing for quite a lot of people, I highly recommend stumping up that extra 100 quid for the 5G model if you can spare it, and I'll explain why in a jiffy. So I've been playing with Samsung's Galaxy S20 Fan Edition 5G for about a month now I've had my sim slapped in there full time for the last week and here is my in-depth review and for more on the latest greatest tech please do pop subscribe and ding that notifications bell. Cheers! Now if you saw my hands-on review with this beefy blower you'll know that it comes in a simply splendid selection of colours. The red, orange and mint versions are particularly dashing so of course I ended up with this boring navy one. If you want to inject just a smidgen of joy into your 2020 then definitely scout out those brighter models but this darker alternative is still perfectly likeable. A Series 7000 aluminium frame is sandwiched between a Gorilla Glass 3 display and a glastic arse and that is Samsung's own term for a hybrid glass and plastic material. It feels more like plastic than glass admittedly but the matte finish does a reasonable job of hiding that smudgy badness although you will of course still be required to drag it across your sleeve every so often to keep it looking smart. And so far that Glastic finish has definitely proven a lot more hardy than your bog standard plastic efforts. I've thrown this thing into countless bags, I've generally abused it to heck over the past sort of month or so, and so far not a single scratch or scuff or scrape on that back end. And you've also got that IP68 water and dust resistance, just like the full fat S20 flagships, so no worries if the fat edition ends up in the drink. Those bezels surrounding the screen do seem a little thick here as well after using other phones like the OnePlus 8T. It's nothing offensive, but it just detracts from the premium experience just like the glastic materials. The main problem here was that my palms kept intruding on the bottom corners whenever I was stretching to reach something, especially when typing messages. And that's a problem that I didn't even experience on the pocket bustingly enormous Note 20 or the Galaxy S20 Ultra, so it makes it even more of a peculiar issue here. Thankfully, Samsung's One UI launcher serves up the usual one-handed mode, which is an absolute blessing at times. And as usual, you can drag down that notifications bar from absolutely anywhere. And that one-handed mode is just one of many, many, many features added to Android 10 by Samsung's own One UI 2.5 launcher, which is very, very dense, but it's also pretty damn likeable. The only real issue that I have with One UI is the same one I've had for years and years now, is the fact that Samsung always doubles up on lots of features that Android already does particularly well. It's got its own contactless payment system, it's got its own app store, it's got its own password filler, it's got its own virtual assistant, it's got its own web browser and all kinds of other apps. It's completely unnecessary and it can be particularly annoying, especially if you're already coming from another Android phone where you've got all that stuff set up and now you've got to bloody do it all again. But the Knox security features are a welcome addition as always, adding an extra layer of protection that some other Android phones miss out on. Likewise, you've got plenty of customization here, including a very handy always on display and some worthy extras like the game booster feature for blocking notifications and monitoring your battery life while you're capping fools online. Now, if you want to squint at some of the best features packed into One UI version 2.5 here on the Galaxy S20 Fan Edition, definitely go check out my full in-depth tips and tricks guide, which is live right now. But the good thing here is you're basically getting that same fully featured software experience as you do on the Billy Big Bollocks S20 flagship phones, even though you're paying a little bit less. You've got an optical in-display fingerprint sensor here and that works a charm too as long as your fingers aren't too wet or too dry. And you've also got a reliable bit of face recognition as backup as long as you aren't face masked up at the time. The general specs here are solid and in keeping with rivals like the OnePlus 8T around the same sort of price point. So for instance you've got a fairly generous 128 gigs of storage on board UFS 3 as well and that can be expanded by a further terabyte by bunging in a micro SD memory card, something that a lot of rivals don't actually offer. Sadly you don't get a quad HD display here unlike the flagship S20s but that 6.5 inch super AMOLED screen is still a winner. And besides with the standard S20 flagship phones you had to choose between that quad HD resolution or that tasty 120Hz refresh rate. Here there's no decision to be made just 120 all the way baby. And of course the 2400 by 1080 pixel resolution is absolutely fine anyway. Whatever you're watching the picture is packed with fine detail. You can tweak the colour output to enjoy natural looking images or have the S20 Fan Edition spew a rainbow of colours right into your face. 
However, there was no support for HDR streaming on the likes of Netflix, which is a bit batty given the price of this thing. And you've also got a thoroughly decent stereo speaker setup here on the Galaxy S20 Fan Edition as well. It's definitely not one of those efforts where the top speaker just guffs out a tinny pathetic excuse for noise. Audio sounds proper nice through a pair of good headphones with full Dolby Atmos support, but the lack of headphone jack here means I had to stick to Bluetooth. Thankfully, I had absolutely zero issues there as well. The connection to my headphones, speakers, whatever I decided to pair up with stayed strong and stable as long as I didn't stray too far away. And this 5G version of the Samsung Galaxy S20 Fan Edition also, unsurprisingly, comes with one of Qualcomm's 5G modems packed inside and you got sub 6 connectivity as well as millimeter wave particularly good news for you US folk and it means a good bit of extra future proof in here as well especially with a good bit of Wi-Fi 6 action on board there too and even if you couldn't give two shiny shillings about 5G right now you should still strive to get the more expensive model of the fan edition because it's been gloriously blessed with Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 chipset rather than Samsung's own Exodus 990 and frankly it's like a Premier League team having to choose between Harry Kane or Johnny Vegas as their next star striker. It's not quite that much of a discrepancy, but still. Complete with the flat display and that 240Hz touch response rate, plus those aforementioned gaming tools, the S20 Fan Edition is a fine way to enjoy your favourite online murderthon. Call of Duty played on the maxed out settings with a perfect frame rate, exactly as you would hope. And Samsung's blower doesn't really heat up under duress either, no matter what you're up to. And the Snapdragon 865 chipset also proved a superstar when it came to battery life. That 4,500mAh cell never once even came particularly close to run and dry by the end of a long day, even with plenty of screen on time. And that's with the 120Hz refresh rate active, always on display, all of that good stuff. Case in point, it's 10 a.m. exactly right now. I've been up since just after 7. I've been using this thing to read from the script. I've been streaming music, all kinds of stuff, and I've still got 93% battery life. Things are remarkably less impressive when it comes to the recharging, however, because although the Samsung Galaxy S20 Fan Edition can support up to 25 watt wired charging, unfortunately you only get a 15 watt charger bundled in the box. And considering this thing, it's a little bit cheaper than the S20s, but it's not exactly cheap, that's an absolute freaking crime. You do thankfully at least still have support for 15 watt wireless charging here on the Fan Edition as well, although I found that when using the likes of the Pixel charger, the OnePlus chargers, it took hours and hours to fill back up again. Now let's finish up with a squint at the camera tech and you do get a triple lens setup like those flagships but it isn't quite the same hardware here. The 12 megapixel primary lens has built in OIS and this captures impressive detail with every snap proving once again that you don't need a 64 or 108 megapixel lens to shoot good looking photos. Colours are quite naturally grabbed as long as you knock off the AI modes, although I did find that the colour detail was lacking in some of my test shots with cooler visuals than seen in real life, usually when the conditions were a bit bright. Still, the Galaxy S20 Fan Edition can generally cope just fine with sharp contrast, these odd spots of oversaturation aside. The second lens is a 12 megapixel ultra wide angle effort, and while this produces slightly darker, warmer pictures than the primary lens, it is definitely handy for capturing a more dramatic photo or the whole of something that is flipping huge as long as you use it outdoors because indoors it's next to useless. And sure, the Samsung Galaxy S20 FE may only serve up an 8 megapixel telephoto lens rather than the gigantic 64 megapixel effort of the standard S20, but you still get three times optical zoom and you've got that optical image stabilization bunged in there too. The total zoom maxes out at 30 times, although things get grainy long before then. But still, up to around the sort of 10 times zoom level, you get a crisp picture. Very handy for taking photos without intruding on a scene. In serious low light, you can depend on Samsung's night mode, which captures and combines between 40 and 30 images at different exposures. The results are brighter, more balanced, with very respectable colour reproduction too, unlike those bright light shots. With the live focus mode, you can make your photo all about your subject, and this once again works splendidly. The accuracy really is impressive, and you can change the blur effect afterwards if you're not entirely satisfied. That single take feature introduced on the original S20 phones is back in action too, if you can't decide whether you want to do pictures or video. Speaking of video, Samsung phones usually do that pretty damn well. And sure, there's no AK option here on the Galaxy S20 Fan Edition, unlike that beefcake flagship. But you know what? I'm guessing not many people will actually give a shit. You can still record up to 4K Ultra HD resolution footage here at either 30 or 60 frames per second with full HDR support when required. And the S20 Fan Edition does not disappoint point, serving up good looking video with dependable image stabilisation when you're moving about. You've got a lot of features to play around with, including of course that live focus mode which has improved over earlier incarnations. And you can swap between all three lenses on the fly for impressive flexibility when you need it. 
You've also got that proper pro mode as usual if you want to tweak the settings and enjoy the silky smooth slow zoom action. And this is something that many rivals still don't offer. And last up for the camera tech, you've got that 32 megapixel selfie snapper, which can offer quite a wide view if you want to squeeze a few peeps in there. And you've once again got those portrait mode smarts on board too. On the whole, it is a solid effort, although occasionally when I was shooting against a bright background, I ended up looking a bit soft, so to speak. So overall, I've got to say I enjoyed my time with the Samsung Galaxy S20 Fan Edition. The specs are perfectly fine for that sort of price point, but unfortunately it does have very strong competition from the likes of the OnePlus 8T, uh, the Xiaomi Mi 10T Pro, and basically a whole bunch of other smartphones that are just priced under the sort of typical flagship 800 to 900 pound price point. My only real qualm is that the S20 Fan Edition doesn't really do anything different from the rest of the competition, unlike something like Sony's fresh new Xperia 5 Mark II. But anyway, that's what I think. What do you think? Have you been using the Galaxy S20 Fan Edition as your own smartphone? It'd be great to hear your own mini review down below if you've been having any issues or anything like that, or if you just absolutely ruddy love the thing. Likewise, if you're tempted, it would be great to hear your thoughts as well. And please do poke subscribe and ding that notifications bell if you haven't already, and have yourselves a lovely rest of the week. Cheers, everyone. Love you.